we will go to the next speaker uh, dr priyanka rotagi and uh, she is uh, a chief dietitian at uh, uh, apollo hospitals bangalore and she is a president ida bangalore chapter and uh, also nsc ida elected member and uh, she is a qualified msc phd and also certified with the espan and uh, triple l uh and uh, also with 20 years of experience in clinical dietetics and research and uh, faculty for many online pro programs nutrition quotient and iba initiated programs on weight management and has eight gold medals to her credit awarded with international award from uk and uh, enroll group for the basic uh, for the best scientific work for the year to uh, 2007 and uh, um, green belt in six sigma certification qualified trainer for five s japanese workplace management concept and uh, also uh, she has research uh, and taken contributed many articles uh, both in press and print and 50 plus research publications to her credit and uh, we welcome you ma'am thank you so much and at the very outset i'd like to thank the organizers for having me here may i request you to kindly allow me to share my screen yeah thank you so this is a very vast topic that i'm covering today and uh, this is an important topic and dietitians don't really find it so much interesting because this is not very very clinical so as to say but this takes at least 60% of our uh, you know work that we do so we will have to pay some attention to the safety protocols that are there in the hospital now safety is uh, you know something which is always always not on our priority list because when it comes to patients or the caregivers or the consultants or uh, everybody talks about food in terms of taste availability affordability convenience but safety takes a second seat but safety has to be very important because in a hospital setup it's a part of the medical nutrition therapy and not just a taste driven uh thing so uh if you look at the definition we are basically talking about absence of harmful chemical substances which can come naturally into the food due to deterioration as the previous speaker was talking about or it could be a contamination which might come from various sources we'll talk about it uh in detail in the coming slides we also have to make sure that the raw material that we use be it some frozen raw material or any of those it's free of pathogens so there is no spore or any uh, tiny form of the microorganism already present in the vegetables in the grains that we are using and if you are using anything which is a semi finished product a uh, semi processed or something as a raw material we need to be very sure on the labeling now this is very important in a hospital because we are catering to patients who may be dealing with challenges in their electrolyte lev levels we are dealing with transplant patients cardiac patients renal patients so any additives preservatives extra salt that is added in the food product as one of the preservatives may make a lot of difference to their levels in the body these are some definitions that we if no would be helpful so uh, these are technically used uh, to say that who should be aware of it all of us because it impacts all of us all of our work now two terms that we need to be familiar with one is gras that is generally recognized as safe a certain amount of additives are considered to be safe and can be tolerated within a certain percentage which is specific to each additive and then we have n o a e l which stands for no observed adverse effect level so these are two terms which generally you would find when you're handling the manuals of these uh, topics so the issues in india are that all across food poisoning is very very rampant we find so many patients coming to the emergency immediately post festivities because of eating out so frequent episodes of acute ge vomiting nausea etc is very common we also find a lot of food borne infections vegetables and fruits having a lot of pesticide contamination meat and poultry carrying antibiotics certain ripening agents arsenic contamination fluoride in the water adulterated milk and the list goes so on and so forth so owing to all this it's very important that we know what we are dealing with fssci has very clearly given out manuals of each of them 
And as dietitians working in hospital, I think we all should go through all those manuals, which gives us a clear cut definition. And especially for the hospitals who are going for NABL, uh, NABH accreditation or uh, JCI accreditation, this kind of uh, standard has now been introduced. So in the seventh and in the eighth edition of JCI, you would find it mandatory to have complete information of these. And this is one of the standards where you can be measured. So this is one of the guidelines from FSSAI, which talks about quite a lot of details. It covers all the food business operating uh, modules, any kind of uh, you know, food related uh, business that is there. So it clearly defines all those. I won't get into those technical details, but I would talk to you more from a hospital perspective. Now, why are we so concerned and why are we all a part of this program today? Because uh, we're dealing with food, which is not just normal food, which has some alterations done due to the requirement of the medical nutrition therapy for our patients. There are dietary requirements to be met. So it's very, very important that we are very uh, aware of these topics and we pay a lot of attention to them. So when we talk about what would be the main quality aspects in a hospital diet, number one should be the food safety and hygiene, which is utmost important, right from the raw material to the cooking process, to the various series of processes, to the manpower handling the food, to the hands transporting the food. So there are series of processes. All of us need to sit down with the team, the FNB team, the operations team, the dietetics team, draw down the SOPs and have a clear cut understanding. Now, 5S is something which has helped us a lot of uh, times in having a lot of these processes streamlined to a greater extent. And if you have a certain degree of learning towards Lean Six Sigma, be it yellow belt or green belt processes, that will help you eliminate a lot of unvalue added processes during the uh, SOP creation. Starting from quality of raw material, though it is handled by the materials or the FNB of the department, but there has to be an oversight from the dietetics so that we are very sure that what we are planning to order and cook for the patient in terms of the menu is right from the beginning of the raw material level, uh, authentic and clear cut food. In terms of the grains, we need to be very sure that the grains that are procured, though they are tender based and you know, uh, the company which is offering a reasonable amount of tender throughout the year is given the tender, but the quality over a period of time may deteriorate. So constant audits on this would help us in terms of assessment of quality, in terms of heavy metal, pesticides, herbicides. So sometimes you may have to send the raw material for random checks to the labs. Adequate infrastructure and facility, because sometimes a lot of crisscrossing, lack of light and, you know, small spaces can be an area of uh, contamination. So we have to be sure that the place for food production is well lit, nice and spread out and there's no crisscrossing. The personnel who's handling the food may not be as educated as you and me are, but we need to make sure that they understand the importance, the hygiene, the regular checkups that is needed for them is in order. The nutrient composition and density is our domain, so we need to take care of it. And we need to make sure that the menu that has been planned has adequate acceptability. Now, these are the various hazards which you may encounter when it comes to food. So it could be bacterial, which is biological, chemical, and physical. In biological, you may find a lot of bacterial contamination, viral, parasite, a lot of naturally occurring chemicals in the food as the food ripes or overripes. And then we find that if not paid attention to, there may be tiny worms or flies which might come in. Mycotoxins, food allergens, these are important parameters to be looked at. Looking at cleaning and sanitizing products, sometimes because it is bought in bulk, so the quality may be a little deteriorated, there may be chemicals which would not be best suited for a clinical setup in a kitchen. So you have to be a little aware and have an eye on these uh, raw materials that are coming in for cleaning. The pest control is done very diligently in a hospital kitchen. What are the kind of pesticides that are being used to kill those pests? What are the bleaching agents used to clean those deep, uh, you know, deep cleaning of those heavy utensils in the kitchen? Are they using caustic soda? Is there any unsuitable metal container? Are they using a lot of silver foil, excessive food additives? And kitchen is a place of constant activity. So you would find a lot of accidents which might happen like 
things getting broken, sharp knives are being used, you're using glass. So, you know, uh, broken glass, uh, nutshells, bolts, uh, the nuts from the equipments that you're using, hair, fingernails, pins, pen, uh, you know, things, dressings of the patient. So these are certain things we have to be very, very careful on. Stones in the grains or plastics being, uh, you know, dispensed from any of the raw material, certain dried leaves which might come in when you buy the greens, paper and packaging material, pest bodies, eggs, nesting material. So these are something we have to have a close eye on. And random audits, as random as maybe weekly ones, would be something which would give you a good control of your kitchen as a workspace. Now, there are, uh, you know, more stringent parameters in a hospital kitchen because we are catering to not just tasty food, we are catering to food which has to be texture familiar for age and health parameters. We can't really use a lot of fruit and vegetable depending on the restrictions of their electrolytes. We can't be using uh, too much of carb-based drinks, a uh, carb-based uh, food, because we don't want the sugars to go deranged. If there are renal restrictions, we can't be unlimited on our protein intake. There are fluid restrictions. So there are so many restrictions. So we have to be very, very careful that within those specifications, we are able to put all these parameters in control. Now, what we have to remember is if we are able to sort out the temperatures correctly. Now, to know that the temperature is correct, we need to monitor the temperature regularly. And we would find that most of these places do not have an air condition. So if you have a dry storage area, it is very, very important that you have a temperature monitor. And especially in places like Delhi, Calcutta, um, or even Chennai for that matter, where there's a lot of humidity and temperature fluctuations are quite high, it becomes really warm. So you have to have the temperature monitor mounted on the wall, which constantly gives you an average and somebody logs it down regularly so that you know that you are not creating an ambient temperature for these microorganisms to grow. They rapidly grow between five degrees to 60 degrees. So we need to understand the danger zone. And if consistently this is the temperature, the place has to have some amount of air conditioning and hydration control. Things which have to be stored at a frozen temperature have to be taken care of. Now, sometimes we don't pay attention to the freezer cleaning that often. And freezer is another very, very important area of infection. So we have to be careful that these freezers are kept in control. When they are cleaned, a log is maintained. All the food is safely uh, transported or shifted to another freezer. And accordingly, the temperature or cold chain is maintained. What could also be a source of contamination is the water that you're using in your kitchen, the raw material we've discussed. So correct temperatures, holding time. Now, this is something that uh, may have an oversight from the dietitian, but it can contribute to a lot of problems. So we need to be very clear that right in the SOPs, and we display it at multiple points throughout our kitchen, that this is the holding time for a specific food item, be it juices, beverages, sandwiches, uh, salads, cut fruit. So if you have various items, empty number of items, each item should have a best before time and should be utilized within that time. Every food has to be labeled so that nobody makes a mistake in consuming something which may have some contamination. And food poisoning in terms of um, the other hazards, it may also come from the food handlers. So we have a ho whole lot of people handling the food right from KSTs to the chefs, to the supervisors, to the uh, boys who are serving the food. So we have to be very careful that hand hygiene is carefully monitored in all of them. Uh, we found this method very useful that we've put a one hourly alarm in the kitchen. The alarm rings and whoever is doing whatever work leaves that, comes and washes the hand. Now, though it may be a little tedious thing to do, leaving all your work and running around and doing this, but we are making sure that in between, if they are touching themselves or scratching hair, you know, their hair or something, this is totally taking care of the hygiene part of it. All raw materials that are being handled have to be segregated and pests and animals have to be under control. So now if we look at what other things have to be looked into is, apart from the food handlers, when you receive the poultry or the milk, because that is a good source of contamination. So that should come to you in a cold chain. This is one of the JCI requirements and they ask uh, you for the temperature monitoring 
like from the source when the chicken or the uh, you know dairy or the poultry came to you even eggs for that matter how they were transported do you have an oversight on that was the temperature log maintained did you receive and maintain a temperature log and thereafter how did you handle the food so this is one step if we as a hospital fail to do so this can attract and um, a non compliance from these accreditation bodies so we have to be very careful on that other sources of contamination we've all discussed now let's move on to the chopping boards now chopping boards are something which potentially is very rampantly used throughout the kitchen so it's very important that there's no criss crossing best is if you have a little space and you could segregate the counters for veg non veg so that the chopping boards don't get uh, interchanged if you could have dedicated color coded chopping boards that really helps so there are standard color codings given by the food authority if the same can be utilized it's really good every shift that is over the food uh, chopping boards have to be thoroughly cleaned there are protocols and you must ensure that these protocols are followed very diligently in your kitchen also we do not entertain any kind of liquids being like if you know you have washed the glasses or the cups or whatever they should never be in a liquid state so if there is a dish washing uh, machine which at a very high temperature can hydrate out all the extra moisture that would be a good practice if not never use wipes for that because wipe from one container to the other would go on and would transfer uh, infection so if they are air dried that is the best they should at all points of time should be dry and not dripping at any point of time the other concerns we have to be very sure that we have defined sops for each what is the safety and risk assessment criteria of our facility what are the mandatory and desirable standards uh, depending on the law of the land we have to make sure that for each process that we follow in our kitchen we have all these in place it's always better to have a trained fnb manager who works with you who can help you set up all this and you can have an oversight on it labeling guidelines are very clearly mentioned health claims as to to what extent this is accepted this is not accepted provision related to uh, the additives formulations aids contaminations etc so these are very very clearly defined we need to have some knowledge on that so that we are able to have an oversight now looking at types of standards these are very clearly mentioned and the previous speaker spoke a little bit about it and if we looked at these manuals very clearly we would be able to get more knowledge on these parameters due to the paucity of the time i'm not covering this i would directly move into um, the detailed manual that fssai has about the location and the layout the equipment and fixtures storage all these parameters that are needed in a kitchen now let's look at how do we maintain so first of all have a blueprint of the location of your kitchen the infrastructure facility the staff requirement a clear cut uh, you know uh, organogram as to how much space is allocated and how much manpower is where so that you could easily pick and uh, rectify the processes so this is how we should ideally do it we should have a clear cut dedicated receiving area in the receiving area there should be a provision of checking temperature washing the raw material so if you have things which are really dirty like your um, you know ginger or rhizomes which are really dirty so you could wash them put them in a sieve kind of a stainless steel container so that the water is drained out and then once they are dry they get into the fridge or the cold storage uh, weighing me mechanism also has to be there and cold or hot temperature measurement also should be there these registers here should be able to capture the weight the temperature and the uh storage conditions that are required and accordingly then you clean out and shift them if you have a non veg facility you have to be very careful that you buy the clean cuts which are in cold storage so that you could continue the cold storage if you buy and cut it on your own then the butchery area has to follow the protocols which are needed once the food is received depending on the kind of perishability it has it gets into the dry storage or the cold storage and among the cold storage also each food item may require different temperatures so we need to have segregated cold storages like very low temperature deep freezer and the regular walk in freezers then we have the washing area where once whatever days use raw material is picked up it's thoroughly cleaned and then it moves into the kitchen now before your food 
moves into the kitchen. The kitchen is a place which has to be thoroughly cleaned. So you should not be having any washing and all that in the cooking area. This has to be a level before that. Before anything enters the kitchen, there has to be a big sink where everybody can hand wash up till the uh, elbow level. So there enters the pre-preparation area where, where all your chopping, cutting, weighing, all that will happen. And once the pre-preparation is done, the food gets into the cooking area, from the cooking area to the dishing out area where the cooked food will be trolleyed. Then if you have specific requirements where you are setting it into specific trays that gets into that, the specific trays go into the specific trolleys and thereafter the services made. So let me take you through each and every in brief uh, area, in brief um, way. So in the receiving area, the kitchen entrance should have an air curtain so that the temperature variation is not very uh, clear. So you can't really put a door right there. You have to have an air curtain and you have to make sure that the fire exits are clearly marked because kitchen is an area where the entry point should not be the main fire exit for the kitchen because there you'll have the air curtain. Now, then you have the storage area, wet and dry, which we discussed, clearly segregated, nothing to be kept on the floor, nothing to be kept at the ceiling up to 18 inches. There should be a gap from the ceiling to about 18 inches of your storage. You have to have good stands, ideally stainless steel stands because they are termite proof so that you can have your containers where the raw material is clean, clearly labeled in terms of the uh, you know, time when it is received and expiry, etc. Perishable items like milk, curd, butter, cheese, etc. has to go into a semi-finished uh, product. Now, we have different freezers for that matter. You can't really keep your idli dosa batter and uh, you know, tomato purees and milk and butter together with the vegetables, because there is a lot of crisscross uh, contamination which might happen. So if you can segregate the racks in the walk-in freezer, or if you could have dedicated two freezers for semi-finished products and raw products, it really helps. Looking at the washing area, washing area should have clear-cut coatings for if there is a dishwasher, uh, the pot pan washing area and the pre-preparation washing. So vegetable washing is generally not done in your dishwashing or in your uh, pot washing area. It has to be segregated separately. Every hospital follows certain protocols like salt water washing or potassium permanganate washing or warm water washing. So depending on what is the protocol in your setup, you could adapt that, but make sure that it is scientific and you're not introducing any chemical into the food. The cooking area is the next uh, area to the pre-preparation area. So you have to make sure that crisscrossing of knives and there is enough space that, you know, there's enough space that there's no crisscrossing which is happening. And there has to be minimum traffic. Not everybody and anybody is allowed in this area. Serving area is a place where you have, if you do 5S here, it really helps you because 5S is, as the word says, 5S. You have S's for each and it, it earmarks a place for everything and everything will go in order. The trolley setup area, depending on what kind of trolleys you have, if you have heating trolleys or if you have hot cases that you're using, accordingly, you have to have your setup uh, carried out and then you have the exit. In between all this, you have to make sure that you have enough fire protection equipment, you have gas pipelines, which are clearly labeled in terms of the flow. So if you have the pipe, if you're using different kinds of gases, if you're using, say, LPG, you have to make sure that on the LPG pipe, there is an arrow which indicates the gas is flowing from where to where. So in case of any unforeseen fire episodes, the person knows where to shut off the uh, point. Inpatient processes, we have to make sure that daily regular rounds are done. And depending on what protocol you have in your hospital, if you visit all patients, so assessment within 24 hours so that you can plan and give the diet sheets to the kitchen so that they know how much of normal diet, soft diet, cardiac diet or whatever diets you have in your hospital are, uh, you know, you have enough number uh, and planning time for those to be done. Self-monitoring is important. It's always good to have a daily food record and activity log. Dietitians are not available 24 hours. So having a night log also is very important as to after the dietitian left, what was the order that was received to the kitchen and from where. 
Internal and external cues and triggers with overeating can be picked up. Now, food is a stimulus to many people and pilferage is very common. So you have to change the eating behavior. You should never entertain any kind of eating within the kitchen or service area. And these have to be time and again reinforced by putting penalty and counseling and talking to people. So regular training has to go in there. Now, this is one picture where, you know, if most of the times you would see that the facility is made, but it is so unusable that you can't really use it properly. So can anybody actually wash in this place? Not really. So you have to make sure that you have a clean area where you could actually have temperature control, you have quality checks, and you know this is a small specific compact unit which can easily get into your um, you know, receiving area, and you could make sure that the vegetables are disinfected right at the point of receiving. And it also has temperature control in it. The Priyanka. other things, sorry? Uh, Dr. Priyanka, I think Dr. Aravind is waiting. Okay. Uh, she has to go, yeah. I'll just sum up, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Then monitoring the chopping boards, which I was mentioning, the color-coded ones and ensuring they're cleaned regularly. The cooked and raw food is not mixed at all. Temperature monitoring. We have to make sure that these kind of things don't happen in our kitchen. So a regular visit from the dietitian morning and evening really helps. Displaying things all across the kitchen is very important. Another area is disposal of the food. So you have to be very careful. Also on the style of service. Now here, I'll just take two more minutes to talk about disposal, one, pest control, the other one, and also making sure that you have regular checks and the grooming standards maintained for your staff. The checks would be the microbial check. And if they go on a long holiday, you have to make sure that you do a stool test to ensure that they're not carrying a typhoid virus in them. Lamina flow food for your liquid sections to make sure that you are serving sterile uh, feeds and storing them properly. So those are things that we have to monitor right from each and every process that we have in our kitchen. So we have to make sure we are more organized, follow 5S in your kitchen, and all the safety protocols are available. We can use them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a very detailed uh, about our uh, kitchen and then the kitchen protocols and Though dietitians, we it is a part of our regular duty being in uh, kitchen.